Hello and welcome to the July 13th, 2020 World News Edition with me, your host, Touring News. We'll begin with coronavirus cases in the United States. The total amount of cases confirmed have been 3,296,599 cases, with total fatalities being 134,884. New coronavirus cases yesterday in the United States was 60,469, with new deaths at 312. When Kaylee McEnany was speaking today, the United States Press Secretary, she stated that we were reaching approximately 800,000 United States coronavirus tests per day. This means that we would be around a 7.5% positivity rate in the tests. Americans' face mask usage varies greatly by demographics. The amount of males that wear face masks always is 34%, very often 29%, sometimes 13%, rarely 4%, and never 20%. The same numbers for females are always 54%, very often 27%, sometimes 8%, rarely 3%, and never 8%. By party identification, Republicans always wear their face masks 24% of the time, 22% of the time very often. 18% of the time sometimes, 9% of the time rarely, and never 27% of the time. Independents claim they always wear their face mask 41% of the time, very often 27, sometimes 12, rarely 2, and never 18. And for Democrats, 61% of the time always worn, very often 33, sometimes 4, rarely 1, and never 1. And the final piece of information that I found illuminating from this, by region breakdown. In the Northeast, always the face mask is worn 54% of the time, 23% very often, sometimes 10%, rarely 4%, never 8%. In the South, 47% always wear them, very often it's worn 26% of the time, 11% for sometimes, 3% for rarely, 13% for never. In the West, 42% always, 33% very often. 10% sometimes, 4% rarely, and 10% never, and in the Midwest, 33% of the time always, very often 29, sometimes 11, rarely 4, and never 23% of the time. This uh, Gallup poll uh, asked approximately 80 to 100,000 people to get a large survey size and sample. An American failure, new surge in coronavirus cases strains the United States testing capacity The COVID-19 testing system is reaching a brink as growing demand surpasses what the nation's labs can handle, sparking supply shortages and backlogs. The demand for tests has skyrocketed in the wake of reopenings and the corresponding rise in cases. Lab supplies are dwindling in many of the hardest hit regions and delays in turnaround times have undercut contact tracing efforts. The Wall Street Journal is also stating that CVS, which tests tens of thousands of patients daily, initially promised results in three to five days and is now telling people to expect a wait of between five to seven days because of backlogs at testing sites. Walmart says tests took around two days as recently as late June, now take four to six because demand has increased in recent days as a result of cases in such states as Texas. For an Oklahoma tribe, vindication at long last, after decades of betrayals and broken treaties, the Supreme Court ruled that much of Oklahoma is their land after all. The court's 5-4 declaration that much of Tulsa and eastern Oklahoma had long been a reservation of the Muskegee Creek Nation was seen as a watershed victory for Native Americans' long campaign to uphold sovereignty, tribal boundaries, and treaty obligations. For Muskegee citizens who make up the country's fourth largest Native American tribe, it was also something deeply personal, a thoroughly American moment that rippled across time connecting ancestors forced to leave their homes in the southeast with future generations. I believe, now this has been a hard story for me to understand, that this means that they will only be under federal and tribal jurisdiction and will no longer be under state jurisdiction under Oklahoma, but this is a story that I'm not very well versed on yet and I please encourage you to do more of your research on it. 21 people have been injured in a fire at a Navy ship in San Diego. A Navy spokesman said that 17 sailors and four civilians were being treated for injuries after a fire and explosion aboard the USS Bonhomme Richard. It was not immediately clear what had caused the fire or explosion. Defying the United States, China and Iran are nearing a trade and military partnership. The investment and security pact would vastly extend China's influence in the Middle East, throwing Iran an economic lifeline and creating new flashpoints with the United States. The partnership detailed in an 18-page proposed agreement obtained by the New York Times. The Chinese have not claimed that the document is an official document. 
would vastly expand Chinese presence in banking, telecommunications, ports, railways, and dozens of other projects. In exchange, China would receive a regular and according to an Iranian official, an oil trader heavily discounted supply of Iranian oil over the next 25 years. The document also describes deepening military cooperation, potentially giving China a foothold in the region that has been a strategic preoccupation of the United States for decades. It calls for joint training and exercises, joint research and weapons development, and intelligence sharing, all to fight the lopsided battle with terrorism, drug and human trafficking, and cross-border crimes. In an analysis, the Asia-Pacific arms race has taken an ominous turn, as China increases its military might and trust in the United States alliances of Rhodes, Australia and Japan are going on the offensive. Japan is increasing their military budget for the eighth straight year, I believe increasing it to $48 billion, with the purchase of $23 billion worth of United States F-35 planes. In addition, China is steadily modernizing its military, ordering advanced, super-quiet French submarines, and received its first batch of American stealth jets and boosted its advanced naval vessels. The country's geography dictates the bulk of new defense funds will go to the Navy, where most of the new personnel is earmarked. In a statement by United States Secretary Mike Pompeo, the U.S. position on maritime claims in the South China Sea, I will read directly from the document. The United States champions a free and open Indo-Pacific. Today we are strengthening U.S. policy in a vital, contentious part of that region, the South China Sea. We are making clear... Beijing's claims to offshore resources across most of the South China Sea are completely unlawful as its campaign of bullying to control them. In the South China Sea, we seek to preserve peace and stability, uphold freedom of the seas in a manner consistent with international law, maintain the unimpeded flow of commerce, and oppose any attempt to use coercion or force to settle to disputes. We share these deep and abiding interests with our main allies and our partners who have long endorsed a rules-based international order. These shared interests have come under unprecedented threat from the People's Republic of China as Beijing uses intimidation to undermine the sovereign rights of South Asian coastal states in the South China Sea, bully them out of offshore resources, assert unilateral domination, and replace international law with might makes right. Beijing's approach has been clear for years. In 2010, then-PRC Foreign Minister Yang Jiaxi told his Asian counterparts, that China is a big country and other countries are small countries, and that is just a fact. PRC's predatory worldview has no place in the 21st century. They also say the PRC has no legal grounds to unilaterally impose its will on the region. China to sanction United States Senators Rubio and Cruz over Xinjiang. They announced sanctions against U.S. officials, including Rubio and Cruz, in a largely symbolic attempt to retaliate over Washington's moves to punish Beijing for its treatment of ethnic minorities in the Xinjiang region. Xinjiang is China's internal affairs and the U.S. has no right to interfere. We urge the United States to immediately withdraw its wrongful decisions, stop interfering in China's internal affairs, or undermining China's interests. We will make further reactions based on the development of the situation. I could not determine what exactly the sanctions are intended to do. These, however, were comments by Hua at a regular news briefing Monday in Beijing. Peter Navarro says more United States action on TikTok and WeChat to be expected. That the Trump administration is just getting started with the two apps and they would not rule out the United States banning them. Navarro told Fox News on Sunday night, even if TikTok is sold to an American buyer, it would not solve the problem. If TikTok, TikTok separates as an American company, that does not help us. Because it's going to be worse, we're going to have to give China billions of dollars for the privilege of having TikTok operate on U.S. soil. These are always recorded live on my Twitch channel at twitch.tv forward slash touring news. And since it's a live broadcast, we just got raided by Kezbox. Thank you very much for the raid and bringing new viewers into the program. President Donald Trump commutes the sentence of Roger Stone. The action ends legal drama around the president's longtime political advisor. President Trump commuted the sentence of Roger Stone on Friday, wheeled in his executive power just days before his longtime friend and political advisor was set to report to prison. White House Press Secretary Kelly McEnany announced the move, which all but ends any legal jeopardy for Mr. Stone in a Friday night statement declaring that he, quote, was a victim of the Russia hoax that the left and its allies in the media perpetuated for years in an attempt to undermine the Trump presidency. Mr. Stone was convicted in federal court in November of making false statements, witness tampering, and trying to impede a congressional investigation into Russian election interference. He was set to report to prison Tuesday to begin serving a 40-month sentence. Puerto Rico looks to colonial legacy as statues tumble in the United States. 
Amid the racial justice movement, protesters in the United States territory have called on leaders to rethink its monuments. Dozens of activists marched through the historic part of Puerto Rico's capital on Saturday, some wearing traditional Taino clothing as they banged on drums and blew on conch shells to demand that the U.S. territory's government start removing statues, including those of Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. These statues represent all that history of violence, of invasion, of looting, of theft, of murder, said an activist who goes by the name of Pluma and who is a member of Puerto Rico's Council for the Defense of Indigenous Rights. These are crimes against humanity. Fracking firms have failed, rewarding executives and raising climate fears. Oil and gas companies are hurtling towards bankruptcy, raising fears that wells will be left leaking planet-warming pollutants with cleanup costs left to taxpayers. The day the debt-ridden Texas oil producer MDC Energy filed for bankruptcy eight months ago, a tank at one of its wells was furiously leaking methane, a potent greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere. By one estimate, the company would need more than $40 million to clean up the wells if they were permanently closed, but the debts of MDC's parent company now exceed the value of their assets by more than $180 million. In months before the bankruptcy filing, however, the company managed to pay its chief executive $8.5 million in consulting fees, the top lender of the French investment bank that taxes later alleged in bankruptcy court. Whiting Petroleum, a major shale driller in North Dakota that sought bankruptcy protection in April, approved almost $15 million in cash bonuses for its top six executives days before filing, as well as Chesapeake Energy, a shale pioneer, declared bankruptcy last month, just weeks after it paid $25 million in business bonuses to a group of ex executives. Are you noticing a common trend? Diamond Offshore Drilling secured a $9.7 million tax refund under the COVID-19 stimulus bill before filing to reorganize in bankruptcy court the next month. This is what it looks like when a Texas oil boom goes bust in an in-depth review from the Wall Street Journal. The biggest thing that they are highlighting is massive unemployment in the Permian Basin of Texas that is not only affecting the oil patch, it's also trickling into restaurants, it's trickling into the retail sector, into barbershops as an economy that really built up during the boom of the fracking exploratory shale drilling is now going bust, leaving the region crippled economically. 32% of United States households missed their July housing payments. As the economic fallout from the coronavirus pandemic continues, almost one-third of United States households, 32%, have not made their full housing payments for July yet, according to a survey by Apartment List, an online rental platform. 19% of Americans made no housing payment at all during the first week of the month, and 13% only paid a portion of their rent or mortgage. That's the fourth month in a row that a historically high number of households were unable to pay their housing bill on time and in full, up from 30% in June and 31% in May. Renters, low income, and younger households were the most likely to miss their payments. Multinationals shift $1.3 billion, sorry, multinationals shift $1.3 trillion into tax havens every year, groundbreaking analysis reveals. The United Kingdom, Netherlands, Switzerland, and Luxembourg form an axis of tax avoidance that costs governments and their citizens hundreds of billions of dollars per year. The vast scale of profit-shifting multinationals costs governments $330 billion in lost revenues, deepens inequality, and benefits a minority of wealthy individuals and large corporations at the expense of ordinary people and public services, the tax network said. It analyzed a trove of data collected by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, which breaks down for the first time where firms make their profits rather than simply where their accountants choose to say those profits are made. Comparing companies' published accounts to figures reported by the OECD and published this week gives the most complete picture yet of the damage that corporate tax dodging does to nations' public finances. From the 15 countries who reported comparable data, the Tax Justice Network tracked $476 billion of profits shifted into tax havens. After extrapolating the figures out to other countries and accounting for underreporting of tax avoidance, they have estimated that $1.3 trillion is artificially shifted into low-tax countries every year. The worst offender was the Netherlands, whose generous rules on corporate taxation enabled corporations to shift $95 billion of profits, dodging $24 billion in taxes. From flour to canned soup, coronavirus surge pressures food supplies. Food makers work to meet rising demand after initial lockdowns ate through inventories. As of July 5th, 10% of packaged foods, beverage, and household goods were out of stock, up from 5 to 7% before the pandemic, according to the market research firm IRI. ConAgra's chief executive Sean Connolly says, We are running flat out. He said ConAgra won't be able to build up inventory of certain brands, 
such as Chef Boyardee and Healthy Choice, unless demand slows or it further increases manufacturing capacity. Food makers and grocers expect prolonged shelter-in-place orders and restrictions on restaurants as well as a battered economy to result in a longer stretch of eating at home. Added safety measures at plants are slowing operations as well. There is enough food in the United States to keep people fed, but every product might not be available everywhere while inventories are strained. A majority of the Seattle Council pledges to support police department defunding plan laid out by advocates July 9, 2020. Council members added their support Thursday to a roadmap set out to decriminalize Seattle and King e- County Equity Now. In a presentation to the Council's Budget Committee last Wednesday, they said the Police Department's 2021 budget should be reduced by 50% from the status quo. They also said the Department's remaining 2020 budget should be cut by 20% this summer. In doing this, they would remove Seattle's 9-11 dispatchers from police control, scale up community-based solutions to public safety, fund a community-led process to imagine life beyond policing, and invest in affordable housing. The aim in defunding the Seattle Police Department and building a world where we trust and believe in community to provide the safety that we need. The United States will conduct military training with Cyprus, upsetting Turkey. Ankara criticizes the announcement that the State Department will fund military training for the Republic of Cyprus. Moving to international news, pandemic crushes the garment industry, the developing world's path out of poverty. When coronavirus shut stores in the United States and Europe, clothing factories across Asia and hundreds of thousands of workers, clothing factories closed across Asia, and hundreds of thousands of workers, a vast majority of them women, lost their jobs. To scroll through to find the data piece that I was looking for. Uh, Clothes make up nearly 85% of Bangladesh's export earnings and the sector employs 4 million people there. In Cambodia, one in five households has at least one garment worker and 75% of exports are garments, footwear, and travel bags. Vietnam and India are also top exporters, according to estimates. There is no alternative right now to the apparel metal. That's why it's not just a temporary setback, as hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs. Chinese law professor who criticized Xi Jinping over the coronavirus has now been released. Zhu Zhangrun was detained for a week for writing articles critical of President Xi Jinping's handling of the pandemic. He was returned home on Sunday, as well as two of his friends confirmed by the AFP on Sunday. He published an essay, Viral Alarm, When Fury Overcomes Fear, in February, blaming the culture of deception and censorship fostered by Xi for the spread of the coronavirus in China, where the outbreak was first reported. Before he was arrested, I believe he was under house arrest for one week. While America looks away, autocrats crack down on digital news sites, claims the New York Times. Independent journalism is on the defensive from Hungary to Malaysia to speak about the Malaysian censorship. Al Jazeera journalists questioned over the Malaysian documentary. Teams were summoned to police headquarters for a probe into charges of alleged sedition and defamation. Several Al Jazeera journalists involved in a recent documentary about Malaysia's treatment of undocumented workers during the coronavirus pandemic were questioned at the country's police headquarters on Friday as the network defended its journalism and expressed deep concern about the investigation. The short film, called Locked Up in Malaysia's Lockdown, was broadcast on the 3rd of July and investigated the plight of thousands of undocumented migrant workers arrested during raids in areas under tight lockdown. The Defense Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob called on Al Jazeera to apologize to Malaysians, adding that the allegations of racism and discrimination against undocumented migrants were untrue. I do encourage people to look further into this story in the next one that I'm going to cover about the Philippines, as well as what's going on in Hungary in what appears to be a crackdown on the free press internationally, globally, and worldwide. Rodrigo Duterte and Congress allies back in order to shut Philippines ABS-CBN. Shutdown deprives millions of Filipinos access to information while thousands of employees are expected to lose their jobs. Congress members voted against giving the company another 25-year license to operate after a total of 12 public hearings and testimony establishing the channel had violated no legal provisions. Of the 85 committee members in charge of the renewal, seven voted to de- 70 and voted to deny, 11 voted for the renewal, two voted to inhibit, and one voted to abstain. During the video that you could play down here, Rodrigo Duterte is heard saying in an interview that journalists can be executed for the work that they are doing, as it appears that being a journalist in Philippines is one of the most dangerous countries to try to accurately report on the news. 
You do not have to take my word for it. You can, as I will repeat, watch the video to find the claim of Rodrigo Duterte saying journalists can be executed. Moving into protest news that are taking, all around, taking place all around the world, Bulgaria has been rocked by protests amid coronavirus fears. Analysts say powerful business interests and state capture have led to the current political crisis. Political anger erupted on Tuesday when a politician... Uh, that's not the part that I wanted to read. I apologize. The deepening political crisis comes after a series of major political scandals in recent months and amid growing public anger against the government's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Analysts say the root of the present crisis run deep and have to do with the country's weak rule of law and the problematic relationship between the oligarchy and politics. Mali president launches a probe after the protest turns violent. One person has been killed, 20 others wounded, as police fire gunshots and tear gas to disperse anti-government protesters. The rally was organized by an opposition coalition and is the third such demonstration in two months, led by the influential scholar Mahmoud Dekau. The so-called June 5th movement is channeling deep-seated frustrations in the country. Opposition leaders have published a 10-point document calling for civil disobedience with recommendations including not paying fines, blocking entry to state buildings, and occupying crossroads. Calls for calm as the government is criticized for their response to the protests. International and regional blocs condemn the use of lethal force during the demonstrations that we just spoke about. Bloody protests broke out in the capital of Bamako on Friday and Saturday, saying security fired live rounds during clashes with the demonstrators. In a statement released overnight, representatives of the United Nations, European Union, African Union, and the West African bloc ECOWAS condemned any form of violence as means of crisis resolution. The protest has put President Ibrahim Boubacar Kaida under immense pressure, insisting on his resignation despite a number of concessions offered by the 75-year-old in a bid to resolve the escalating crisis. On the 9th of July, Serbia banned mass gatherings after virus lockdown protests. However, Serbians said they do not care, and thousands of Serbians joined anti-government protests in Belgrade on the 11th of July. Protesters, most of them wearing masks, gather for a fifth night near Parliament to demand the president's resignation. We hope the authorities will hear us. We want them to stop lying to us, and we know the entire truth about everything that has been happening in connection with the coronavirus pandemic. Late on Friday, police clashed with demonstrators who threw flames Flares and stones, 14 police officers were injured, 71 people were arrested. The demonstrations were initially driven by frustration over economically stifling measures to contain the spread of the novel coronavirus, but soon evolved into anti-government rallies that demanded Vucic's resignation. Critics say the government's decision to allow football matches in Red Star Belgrade, religious festivities, parties, and private gatherings to resume in May and parliamentary elections to go ahead on the 21st of June are to blame for the surge of infections. Argentinians are protesting in Buenos Aires against government decisions. Argentina is struggling with recession and inflation and is negotiating with creditors to restructure their foreign debt. Some rallied on behalf of farmers across the country, but many more are unhappy with the lockdown. Protests have rocked the Russian Far East with calls for Putin to resign after the new constitution was voted on extending the length of Vladimir Putin's ability to reign in the nation to the year of 2036. Tens of thousands of people protested in Russia's Far East on Saturday in a rare display of opposition to Putin in the country's vast hinterland, chanting, Putin, resign, and demanding the release of regional governor arrested this past week on suspicion of multiple murders. That story was covered on my channel, I believe, on the 8th of July in that day's World News Rundown. It is claimed that these protests were not very covered, as state-controlled media ignored the protests while giving extensive coverage to the troubles in the United States, particularly a spike of coronavirus cases. Do your own research to find out if it was or was not covered there. I did not get to it. I apologize. The Democratic Republic of Congo, three people have been killed in protests against the election chief nomination. Two protesters were killed and one police officer died as demonstrations in several key cities turn violent. The protests were triggered by plans to appoint uh, Ronsard Malanda as the president of the Independent National Electoral Commission. Melinda's nomination was ratified last week by the National Assembly, which is dominated by the former president, Joseph Kabila's supporters, but Shisekedi, the new president, has yet to sign the decision. President supporters accused Melinda of being close to Kabila, who stepped down after 18 years in office, but still wields extensive political influence. 
through his parliamentary majority and control most of the cabinet ministries. Kabila's political alliance denied in a tweet they had anything to do with Mwanda's nomination and said responsibility for the appointment rested with the civil society and religious organizations. Violent demonstrations against a new protest law in Greece. Over 10,000 people peacefully protested, but a group of several dozen, a very small group out of the 10,000 protesters, threw petrol bombs at police who responded with tear gas. Violence broke out in Athens during a mass demonstration against plans to curb public protests. I believe the Greek government is trying to ban any type of protests over 10 people, but somebody, again, please fact check me. And any time that you listen to my analysis, please do go through and fact check me as much as possible. If there are any times that I make a mistake, leave a comment in the section down below, and I will do what I can to rectify those errors. Hong Kong, 600,000 people have cast what they claim to be a protest vote against the new security law. An official poll to decide the strongest pro-democracy candidates to contest the Legislative Council polls in September. The unofficial poll has decided who will be their strongest candidates to run and contest the Legislative Council elections in September. The primaries are only for the opposition camp. Observers were watching closely for the turnout as a, broader, as a barometer of broader opposition to the security law. A high turnout will send a very strong signal to the international community that we Hong Kongers never give up, said Sunny Chung one of a batch of aspiring young Democrats out lobbying and giving stump speeches, and that we still stand with the Democratic camp, we still support democracy and freedom. Russia's Arctic region declares an emergency after a second fuel spill. About 44 tons of aviation fuel is leaked from a pipeline operated by a mining company into a lake near the Tukard town. This follows a previous spill in May of an estimated 20,000 tons of diesel fuel leaked from a tank at a thermal power plant operated by Nor Nickel near Norlisk. 6,000 tons of diesel seeped into the ground and 15,000 tons of fuel ended up in nearby waterways, according to the assessments. The Dutch government is taking Russia to the European... Dutch government to take Russia to European Rights Court over the MH17 plane downing. Boeing 777, traveling from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, was shot down by a missile from rebel-held Ukraine in 2014. A BUK surface-to-air missile fired from territory controlled by pro-Russian Ukrainian rebels destroyed the Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur flight in July of 2014. The reasoning, says Foreign Minister Stef Bloch of taking it to the European Rights Court, is achieving justice for the 298 victims to the downing of flight MH17 is and will remain the government's highest priority. By taking this step today, we are moving closer to that goal. Four soldiers have been killed in the Azerbaijan-Armenia border clashes. Azerbaijan and Armenia trade blame over a new escalation at their border that killed at least four Azerbaijani soldiers. The worry of this is that Turkey will go to back Azerbaijan and Russia will begin to back Algeria. I apologize. Russia will back Armenia. This would be further escalation of their geopolitical tensions that have been playing out in the northwestern region of Idlib in Syria lately. A big reason of the conflict there is between Turkey and Russia trying to angle as Russia tries to get a pipeline out through the northwestern province of Idlib to the sea and export their oil. Poland's nationalist president Duda, a Trump ally, narrowly wins the second term. The result was the closest of any election in Poland's modern history. The outstanding votes are unlikely to trip the outcome of the liberal conservative opposition candidate, the mayor of Warsaw, Rafael Szczykowski, who gained 48.979% of the election votes, with Duda getting 51.21% of the votes after 99.7 polling locations have reported. Serbia and Kosovo have renewed their very difficult talks led by Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel, with the leaders of Serbia and Kosovo begin the very difficult process aimed at resolving their territorial dispute. The leaders of, the, leaders of Serbia and semi-autonomous Kosovo have held their first talks in 18 months on resolving one of Europe's most intractable territorial disputes, agreeing to a face-to-face -face meeting on the very difficult process. Kosovo's Prime Minister Abdullah Hoti and Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic spoke at a video summit on Friday. The discussions followed more online talks on Sunday between Hoti and Vucic as well as European Union officials and a meeting in Brussels on Thursday. There are very different perspective, difficult perspectives for the outcome of this dialogue, but there is a commitment by everyone to proceed to step up. Serbia has refused to recognize Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence after the province broke away in the bloody 1998-1999 war that was ended only by a NATO bombing campaign against the Serbian troops. Millions in southern China face floods caused by heavy rain, with 34 million people affected by torrential downpours which have caused widespread disruption in the country. 
Missing Seoul Mayor Park Won Soon has been found dead in an apparent suicide days after one of the park's former secretaries filed a sexual harassment complaint. Park wrote in a note left on his desk, I apologize to everyone. I thank everyone who is with me in my lifetime. I am so sorry to my family, to whom I have only caused pain. Please cremate my body and scatter the ash over my parents' grave. Rights group Amnesty says coronavirus has killed at least 3,000 healthcare workers. With a concern over unsafe working conditions for frontline workers, low pay, and reprisals in some countries. A ceasefire in Libya would not benefit the government of national accord, claims Turkey. And in a lot of Libyan news, I will do my best to cover this uh, complex region. The NLC, the National Oil Corps, has accused the United Arab Emirates of instructing eastern forces in Libya's civil war, eastern forces being the LNA, which is the military that is spearheaded by Khalifa Haftar, to reimpose a blockade of oil exports after the departure of the first tanker in six months. The UAE, along with Russia and Egypt, as well as France supports the eastern-based self-styled Libyan National Army of renegade military commander Khalifa Haftar, which on Saturday said the blockade would continue, despite it having led a tanker loaded from oil with storage. Haftar claims they are going to continue the blockade until uh, they are trying to get some of the money from the oil production. So Khalifa Haftar will continue the oil blockade until they receive some of the profits. Brazil has bowed to investor pressure and banned setting fires on the Amazon only for 120 days as international groups uh, meet to discuss it. The ban on setting fires in the Amazon is for 120 days in a meeting with global investors to address their rising concerns over the destruction of the rainforest. Yemen's Houthis say a Saudi facility, oil facility was hit in an overnight attack. Saudi-led coalition says it intercepted and destroyed four missiles and six explosive drones fired toward the kingdom. Yemen's Houthi rebels say they've attacked a large oil facility in an industrial complex south of the Saudi Arabian city of Jizan as part of an overnight operation. The Saudi-led military coalition fighting the Houthis said on Monday it intercepted and destroyed four missiles and six bomb-laden drones launched by the Houthis toward the kingdom. The missiles and drones were launched from the Yemeni capital, Yemen's capital Sana'a and directed at civilian targets. The group's ballistic missiles and drones claimed by the Houthis had destroyed a number of military bases and installations near the border in a wide-scale military operation. Additionally, the giant oil facility, the giant oil facility in the Jizan industrial zone, the strike was accurate. United Nations warns that 10 million people face an acute food shortage in Yemen. The World Food Program says it needs 737 million to avert a famine in the war-torn country. The WFP said it needs $737 million to end by the end of the year to keep the aid program running. The humanitarian situation is deteriorating at an alarming rate. We must act now. If we wait for famine to be declared, it will already be too late. Yemen is facing a crisis on multiple fronts. Imports have declined. Food prices are soaring. The real is in free fall. And foreign currency reserves are nearing total depletion. Moving to the other one of the other humanitarian crises happening around the world, the Syria aid deal, the United Nations Security Council manages to keep only one crossing open in a setback for millions of displaced Syrians. Several attempts to keep a second border crossing open failed to pass at the Security Council, with China and Russia voting against keeping these aid channels open. Syria faces, Syria faces severe bread shortages as the U.S. sanctions worsen their economy. Though food is exempt from sanctions, asset freezes, banking restrictions, and a currency route hamper grain imports. I believe the Syrian rial was trading 500 rial to $1. Now it has risen to 3,000. Here it is. The Syrian pound, I apologize. The Syrian pound, which held steady at about 500 to the dollar for several years, went into freefall last year, hitting a low of 3,000 in June in anticipation of fresh sanctions. We're scared. Coronavirus hits Syria's war-torn Idlib. Three doctors and nurse are the first cases to contract COVID-19 in Idlib amid fears of a rapid spread at the IDP camps in northwestern Syria. The number of people living in the sprawling camps has increased in recent months after Russian-backed Syrian government forces launched a campaign to regain control of the last rebel-held bastion in the war-torn country. The first case of the new coronavirus was confirmed on Thursday night. He is a doctor working in Bab al-Hala Border Hospital. The patient developed symptoms including a dry cough and a high temperature last week. He was tested in Idlib and the results came back positive. 
this would be absolutely devastating, absolutely devastating for an already war-torn region. Lebanon is also going through a massive currency crisis as strict currency controls have gutted the nation. Uh, where can I find the information about their currency? Well, the value of the Lebanese currency has drastically plunged as remittances have fallen during the COVID-19 pandemic and the government is going through a realignment as the Lebanese are now also unavailable to afford what they could uh, once buy before and support their, their food supplies. Sorry, that was a sloppy reporting of that one. It's very difficult when you do just a reading through of all of these stories. The assassination of an Iraq security analyst was meant to silence free voices, they claim. Activist journalists fear being targeted in a darker phase ahead after well-connected Hisham al-Hashemi was killed. The assassination of a top Iraqi security analyst this week has sent shockwaves through the country, stirring fears among independent and critical voices, including journalists and activists of even darker days ahead. Hashem al-Hashimi was killed outside his home in the capital of Baghdad late on Monday with security footage from a nearby camera showed masked gunmen walk up to the white SUV and fire several gunshots through the window. They escaped on a motorbike. The three young boys were seen helping neighbors pull his bullet-ridden body from the car. No claim of responsibility and no arrests have been made thus far. South Africa has banned alcohol as coronavirus cases surge. Alcohol sales were reintroduced in June. Hospital experiences spike in emergency ward admissions. I don't understand why they would reinforce a ban on the sale and distribution of alcohol. They're claiming it's to reduce the volume of trauma patients so hospitals have more beds to treat COVID-19. Another article that I'm not very good at reporting on, the Democratic Republic of Congo Justice Minister Celestine Tunda resigns after a dispute. Uh, Sunda did not give a reason for his departure. He leaves the government with the conviction that my actions in the Ministry of Justice made a contribution to the consolidation of the rule of law. He's the first minister to resign from the government, which took eight months of talks to form before it was finally presented last August. In the good news for the day, Sudan ratifies a law criminalizing female genital mutilation. In April, Sudan's cabinet approved amendments to the criminal code that would punish those who perform female genital mutilation. Sudan Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok replaces ministers in a sweeping reshuffle. The reshuffle follows protests urging faster reforms and greater civilian role in Sudan's transition toward democracy. In a statement, the government said transitional Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok had dismissed the health minister and accepted the resignation of Al Badali and others. He leads a government of technocrats under a 39-month power-sharing agreement between the military and civilian groups that was reached following the removal of country's longtime ruler Omar al-Bashir. They've replaced the finance, foreign, energy, and health ministers and three other senior cabinet post holders as part of a sweeping reform last Thursday. A Malawi president is under fire for the family appointments to the cabinet. New 31-member cabinet includes six figures who are related to one another, although not the president. The Human Rights Defenders Coalition, which led sustained countrywide protests against the disputed 2019 elections, said there were widespread concerns. First is the issue of family members in the cabinet, such as husband and wife and brother and sister. We have also noted that 70% of the ministers are from the central region and that Lilongwe has nine ministers alone, and we also know the president comes from Lilongwe. This new Malawi will get rid of nepotism and cronyism, said social activist Mokotoma Katenga Kawunda, that the move was disappointing as the incumbent had promised something different. Sorry, the incumbent promised the quote that I just said. I apologize for making that very sloppy. Two more stories. Japan's empty offices drag real estate shares down. Office vacancies in Tokyo's main business areas have risen for four consecutive months due to the coronavirus lockdowns, gaining to 1.97% from 1.64% in May. A vacancies in Tokyo fell almost unrelentingly for the seven years before Prime Minister Shinzo Abe came to power in 2012, even as rents continued to rise. Fujitsu had already declared its intent to cut office space in Japan by 50% over the next three years. And the final story, dozens of people have been injured in a Taliban attack near an Afghan spy agency office. At least 43 have been injured as gunfire followed the blast near the National Directorate of Security Office in Samangan province. More than 40 people, mostly civilians, have been wounded after gunmen clashed with security forces following a car bomb blast at a government compound in Afghanistan's northern province of Samangan. The attack claimed by the Taliban group on Monday took place at a government facility in Samangan's capital. 
It's a complex attack that started with the car bomb. Clashes with the attackers are still ongoing. The Taliban have claimed the attack. There was also one other attack over the weekend, if I can find it here. 26 security forces were killed in coordinated attacks on Sunday in the Kunduz province, also claimed by the Taliban. This was the coverage of the world news today with me, your host, Touring News. If you like this type of content, you can find me live at twitch.tv forward slash Touring News. You can find me on Twitter at Touring News 1, or you can find me here on the YouTube channel. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below. Share it with your friends. Retweet it out wherever you would like to. You do have my permission to watch this content if you're a live streamer. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. I hope that you have an excellent day.